my name's Tim Holmes. For those of you who haven't met me before, um, I'm a senior partner and head of sales at Serdar, and we have offices in Johannesburg, Cape Town, Accra, and Nairobi. So today what we wanted to talk about, or what I wanted to talk about, was really the risk of ignoring reputation management, particularly in the boardroom. So I think reputation management has been around for a long time and people have been aware of the value of it, but I really want to specifically talk about what we need to be aware of, go through a, an example of where it goes horribly wrong and what the impact can be, and give you some ideas of tools that can help you think about the different areas of reputation management in the boardroom context and the other strategic areas that you typically need to be thinking about as well. So the topic of today is Boeing. So I had lots of fun researching this and quite an amazing story. But the tragic thing was that people lost lives. But the good thing, I guess, that's come out of it is that Boeing's managed to resurrect itself. So let's not be a Boeing, or at least not be a Boeing in the period during the 1910 um, to 1920, basically. So what happened? So what really caused and, and opened up the doors to realizing that something was going horribly wrong at Boeing was on the 29th of October 2018, when the 737 MAX 8, in this particular case, that was run by Lion Air, crashed into the sea and killed 189 people on board. Now, as anyone can think, that's going to be one massive hit to anybody's reputation, and particularly in the airline industry, and particularly with a company that had a hugely a reputable relationship, a re sorry, reputation for safety, for quality, all of those kind of things coming into this period, such as Boeing had. What really cemented it was when it happened again. So less than six months later, in, on the 10th of March 2019, another 737 MAX 8, but this time operated by Ethiopian Airlines, crashed, killing all 157 on board. So that's a huge shift from a company that was seen as being the best in the business, had the safest, the best quality planes for a long period of time, suddenly now in a situation where they've had two plane crashes in less than a year. So what happened? What happened was in the early 90s, they were struggling, but their main issue then was really ramping up and making sure that the teams they had were in alignment with where they were in terms of their sales. It wasn't an issue of changing a culture. It was more an issue of making some tough decisions early enough, looking forward far enough. You know, it was more of a, a general strategy kind of conversation. This wasn't that their culture was broken. It was more that the management just wasn't making the decisions quickly enough than they need to make. And that was obviously affecting their share price. As a way of trying to build their revenue base again, in 1997, they decided to buy McDonnell Douglas that was really struggling um, and it had a primary focus on defense. And what was in the commentary that I've read is the really that the difference of culture came in with that merger because the McDonnell Douglas being in the defense industry, very much that sort of cutthroat managers win at all costs, lots of behind the scenes kind of shenanigans going on, very different from the approach you typically want in the commercial airline space and probably in the other areas that Boeing were involved with as well, such as space and various other different types of vehicles. So it was seen by some of the commentators as the hunter killer assassins meet the Boy Scouts, the company that was made up mostly of engineers and they were focused on doing the best job possible, not on profit at all costs. So the, the new goal was delivering returns to shareholders. And very quickly, the McDonnell Douglas management team started to get equal power and eventually ultimate power in the Boeing setup. And they really drove this agenda. So the old rallying cry of working together started to get impacted quite quickly. And, and a very strong focus was made on returning um, the the business to profitability firstly, but delivering returns to shareholders as the primary, st primary stakeholder. And in that process, a lot of the other stakeholders lost out. 
So the previous generation leaders, they knew everything about the aircraft they were built. As I said, it was driven primarily by people who were engineers at the core. And even the commentary about those in the industry, in their C-suite that weren't necessarily engineers, begin, began over time to start thinking and speaking like engineers, because that was the culture. We produced really good quality, innovative engineering. We weren't so fussed about the time that it took to make it or the costs of building it. We wanted to make sure it was a really good quality, safe product. Whereas the new generation was almost entirely focused on return on net assets. And one of the sort of main um, chasms that starts to open up physically, and I think in terms of the way the leadership was running, was this decision on the 21st of March 2001 by the CEO at the time, Phil Condit, that he announced that the headquarters was moving from Seattle, where a large part of the manufacturing was done, to Chicago. And this was based on guidance from a, a gentleman by the name of Ted Hall, who worked with McKinsey, who was talking about this move that was happening at about this time of moving away the, the leadership away from the manufacturing so they could ostensibly think more about strategy they could focus more on what was happening in wall street they could think about the bigger picture and the best way to do that was to get away from the manufacturing get out of the day-to-day -day, get out of the weeds now there's obviously merit in that but the organization had been built as i said before by engineers so they typically the management worked very closely with the engineers they had a really good insight into what was going on in the manufacturing process now you're moving them to a very swanky office in chicago and it's that mcdonald douglas mindset and focus on return on net assets that's really starting to come into play and now you're building it even more and even more quickly by forcibly moving the leadership team away from their core, away from where the manufacturing is happening, making it much more difficult to get oversight on what's going on and make decisions quickly if you spot that something's not happening the way it should do. So the easiest way to improve RONI is to sell assets. So they went through a, a massive sell-off, um, selling factories, um, outsourcing things that previously they did themselves. They even moved and sold the building that they used to have their mock-ups in, and it ended up being um, on a, in a car park um, in a, an industrial area, which was not ideal. So they're just doing everything they possibly can to make the shareholder, the, the, the RNO and I look good so that the share price goes up. And it worked. It worked for a time. They started cutting R&D because well, why do we need R&D? We can just do more with what we've got. Again, we can cut costs, we can save money, we can increase profit. They started buying stock back. Stock buybacks help improve your share price, but they deplete you of cash. So you can't ride out the, the difficult times easily. And again, you don't have the cash to put into R&D to build new product. So it's almost forcing you into a position where you have to redevelop something you've already got rather than start from new. And then the, the last of the old guard moved out in 2003. Harry Stone Cipher, who was previously from the other company, came in as the CEO. And his language was around, yes, it's a great engineering firm, but we want to move it to a place where it's being run like a business. In other words, it's being run for profit and the main focus is on shareholders. And then 2006, sort of the last of the people who was in the running for the CEO role, who came from the old guard, who'd been with the business for a long time, was Alan Mullally. And he left after being passed over twice as CEO and joined Ford and managed to turn Ford around and was very instrumental in their upswing in terms of Ford's fortunes. And what did he put in there? Innovation, good process, much quality, better quality, all of the things that Boeing had been doing so successfully up to this point. And what was quite meaningful and quite um, significant was that he had a big working together banner right outside his office. And when he left, they took it down. So the question internally was, well, what has that been replaced with? If we're not working together anymore, what are we doing now? Is it just shareholder return? Now you've got competition starting to happen. 
So this is going to have an impact if you're not innovating because Airbus was coming along and really pushing in the commercial air zone space and really com competing headlong with the cash cow that Boeing had, which was their 737. So a year, less than a year later, they announced that the 737 MAX was going to be produced, where they'd fitted more efficient engines to combat Airbus's greater efficiency, but to an existing frame, an existing body that was probably getting a little bit long in the tooth. And what happened was that revitalizing an old system wasn't ideal because putting the new engines on, changing the dynamics of the plane to fit this new equipment, changed the flying dynamics. And we'll talk a lot about that going forward. But what drove that change, or the time to fix that change, was using software to fix it. And they introduced a system called MCAS, which is what fundamentally caused the problems. So we're starting to see this cut in R&D, this push on cost saving, the selling of assets. Now you're forced in a position where you pretty much need to you reutilize, you reutilize an old frame because you don't have the, the innovation coming through the system. You don't have the cash in the bank to really push for something completely new. And then you start to move into the space, which is not what you typically were working with, where you put building safety mechanisms into the software rather than building safety mechanisms into the hardware. Lion Air receives their first one in May 2017, and 18 months later, it, one of their planes crashes into the Java Sea. And the whole thing starts to unravel. So we've got from working together to shell the value only. We're seeing far more of that in governance um, principles these days, where we're thinking far more broadly in stakeholder engagement. This was the 2000s and the 2010s. We, we hopefully moved a long way, and certainly have in South Africa, but certainly moved generally in governance structures to think far more broadly and far more about the overall sustainability and long-term sustainability of the business, not just about quarterly shareholder um, value and shareholder price increases. Moving the head office 1,700 miles away from production definitely had an impact because it moved the leadership away from seeing what was going on in the ground. And they called it the moment Boeing's leadership decided to divorce itself from the firm's own culture, finally divorcing themselves from that engineering culture, that safety and quality culture. And there was a very high turnover CEO. So in the first 100 years of Boeing's life, they only had 10 different CEOs, whereas in the next 10 years, they had five different CEOs. So Phil Condit um, came in, in, was in power when they uh, had the McDonnell Douglas acquisition. He let, quickly left in 2013 after there was a procurement scandal. So they were starting to think about the different changes in culture. They started to have taking shortcuts. There was um, various accusations and people going to, to jail for theft of secrets, for um, going back behind the scenes and using personal influence and personal gain to get procurement to, uh, contracts sorted out. So we're now getting to the point where people are going to jail for this stuff, for taking these shortcuts. Then the new guy from um, McDonnell Douglas, who was CEO of McDonnell Douglas, comes in in 2003, and he very quickly <laughs> left because there was a sex scandal. So they brought in someone else in 2005. Now, Jim McNerley got it right because he got in at the beginning of the change of culture, rode the way for 10 years, stock price went up and then announced the, the 737 MAX and left before the, the uh, problem started to come in. Very clever. He made an absolute fortune. He received $52 million when he joined and he was paid between 10 and $15 million per year in that massive period of growth. But just after he left, we started to get the problems kicking in. And poor old Dennis Mullenberg became CEO in 2015 and then chairman and CEO and president. Uh, so he had all the hats in 2016 and then left in 2019. So you've, you've got the old guard sort of handing over to the new guard, new guard changing all over the place, all kinds of scandals, change of culture, change of value set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some of them doing well, some of them doing not so well. And then you hand over to the poor guy who has to try and ride through this pain point, this disastrous stage where airplanes are falling out of the sky. 
and he only lasts a couple of years and then he's kicked out and the new guy David Calhoun is appointed in 2020 and has tried really really hard to get back to the value system that they had before. So is the asset stripping, the significant drop in innovation, multiple hats. So the culture was you had all of the hats, whereas before that had never been the case and since it's not the case. So we talk a lot about having independence in your boardroom, making sure the chairman is separate from the CEO, they're not the same person. And if you have the president, CEO and chairman, all of the same person, then if they make a mistake, then the whole business gets impacted really quickly. So the result, what happened in terms of the impact on the business? So they paid $20 billion estimated in fines, compensation and legal fees, and then indirect costs of another 60 billion for canceled orders. So the revenue dropped from 101 billion in 2008 to 58 billion in 2020. So the cost of this thing was nearly the entire revenue when they were doing well and is now way more than the revenue they're producing right now. So that's what the curve looks like. This is when that new 737 MAX was released. They got lots of orders. They did really well. They were growing like mad in terms of revenue, pushing the, getting, paying great dividends and everybody was really happy with the share price, et cetera, et cetera. Then October 2018, the Lion airplane crash happens. This is a rolling average, so you can see in the quarters that it didn't impact immediately, but very quickly they started grounding planes, asking questions, and then the next one happened. And then it just falls out of bed completely. You've got massive losses, going, reductions in revenue going on, and the company's never really recovered. Not even close to recovering, even to the levels it was in 2010. So a huge, huge impact on the business. Like basically, all of the stuff that had changed over a period of time, drip feed, boiling the frog, all of those kind of analogies, uh, I think are really Im important to think about, that it doesn't happen overnight. It's a slow change in the way a company is being set up and run that can potentially have a cataclysmic effect down the line. So the culture before was working as a team. Employees had a voice. If they spotted there was a problem, they could go to the leader of their, their team or they could go to someone even more senior and say, look, we have to fix this before this plane can go to the next step. In the days when they're, they're pushing shell to value, if they've spotted a, spotted a problem, they were told to just continue because time was the most critical thing. You must get the thing done on time. But hold on, there's an error. There's, there's stuff in the fuel tanks. They even did investigations of the fuel tanks of the built planes that were still being built after the, all of these issues came up. And there was all kinds of rubbish inside those, those tanks that could have effectively gone into the pipes, gone into the engines, could have caused all kinds of problems just because they were constantly making, taking shortcuts, not finishing, finishing things properly because they had to move on because the time was of the essence. The share price, the profitability was everything. Leadership were involved, engaged before, the working environment felt like a family, people were looked after, very low staff turnover. And their values then, as their values are now, are safety, quality and integrity. But in that period of those, those 10, 15 years when all of this thing was starting to go wrong, they were monitoring the share price every day. It was reported to staff every day. Move from quality to maximizing profit. Time was critical, as I said, quality dropped because they were cutting corners, focused on keeping, the board became focused on keeping reputation, but didn't admit their mistakes. So they started covering things up. And as I said, when you've got the president, the chairman and the CEO all wearing the same hat, will they stand up, stand up in front of the public? Are they going to be as open as if someone independently was saying, we believe there's a problem, we're looking into it, and heads are going to roll. They're going to protect and do everything they possibly can to try and refer back to the reputation they've always had and not admit that there might be a, a problem coming up. And the first thing they did with the first crash was blame the pilot. Blame someone else. Don't blame us. It's not our fault. High staff turnover, same person, little or no accountability at the highest levels. So what can we do? 
to not be Boeing? Well, I, my suggestion is that we make sure that as an organization, we go back to what is our promise? What is our why? Why do we do what we do? So in the olden days of Boeing, it was about safety. It was about innovation. So what are we doing in our organization? What is, what is our promise? Are we really clear on what that is? Because our reputation externally will be measured on that. If we're not living up to that promise, we're not delivering against that promise as an organization and as individuals, then we're going to be found out and we'll be found out quickly. And the, the more we've pushed it and covered it up and made sure that people didn't see it or understand it, the faster we fall. Enron, Steinhoff, all of these have been in that situation. There's plenty of examples where that's happened. And what, the, and what purpose drives compels you. So make sure that your team is also compelled and driven by that promise, because then it's much, much easier to deliver on it. So examples, Disney create magic. So they're, if their theme parks, if their movies, if any of their products online are not creating magic or being seen as magical, then they're not fulfilling their promise. BMW, if it's not rear wheel drive, driving pleasure now, obviously with four wheel drives as well, but it's all about driving pleasure. The way they construct their dashboard is driver focused. The way they build their cars is, tends to be a bit sportier because it's driver focused. If they're not doing that, if they don't have the fastest SUV or the sportiest this, then they're not living up to that promise of pure driving pressure. And Volvo is about safety. So if they are not seen as producing a car that is safe, then they're breaking that promise. So it's important to understand what our promise is. And we can see from in, and the other step is innovation. So Boeing did really well with innovation. So where are we innovating? How are we, how as an organization, are we keeping ahead of the curve? Because as soon as they lost that, they started getting behind, Airbus caught up and overtook in some areas. Now they're fighting and struggling to rebuild the reputation and rebuild their market share because they lost that innovative spark. They weren't producing incredibly popular products like the 747 and the 777 that came after it. It was one of the safest commercial planes ever to fly, according to the commentators at the time. And they've been innovative in lots of other areas. So where are we being innovated? How does that portfolio hang together? And interestingly, the comment in 2020, it looks like Boeing's back in that particular space because it encouraged each and every employee to be creative, disciplined, persistent. We talked about that, it was losing, people were leaving because they weren't, didn't have a voice. Innovation is the heart of what it does. Every decision is geared towards building a sustainable future for the brand, thinking long-term, not just about share price. So it's great to see that they've come full circle. So where are we trying to attract innovators? Because they will ultimately lead to us building a bigger, a bigger market share. And then making sure that we've got the early adopters, but the social proofing is where the reputation kicks in. If we don't have that reputation, then it's much more difficult to move the early adopters into the ma early majority, the late majority and the laggards because they, they need to trust you. They need to make sure that you have a product that may be different from what they've seen before, but they trust the company, they trust the brand, and then they can shift into those who are a little bit more risk averse instead of just getting stuck to where the, the chasm of you get stuck in the early adopter space and you never really build proper market share. So this was a really good commentary I found um, online. Building a reputation is built up of or torn down on character, communication, and trust. So trust, Boeing lost trust. They weren't communicating effectively. They weren't telling people what was going on. They weren't even telling the, po the pilots about the new system that they'd introduced, which was part of the problem. And they moved away from having a really strong value set. So they, their character changed. They moved to much more money focused, money driven, and much more cutthroat. It's not enough to build a good reputation. We also have to protect it and maintain it. Another good one, which, I, which came from Blue Rubicon Institute, who'd done a lot of research into what various directors across different types of businesses 
um, thought had changed in terms of reputation at board level. So corporate boards have always valued the reputation of businesses. Traditionally, they viewed reputation as an important asset, which they're expected to protect or fix as and when the business encountered threats. So it's there, we've built it over time, we're just gonna protect it. But it's not necessarily connected directly to the value that we create as a business. But today boards are, on, are at an inflection point, moving from an implicit to an explicit approach based on the growing realization that reputation is a determinant of value. Companies are seen much more in light of, can we trust them? Um, are they consistent? Are they living up to their promise? And that's how we're gonna value them. We'll pay more for their product. The share price will be higher because of that, those factors. So it's a potent source of competitive and commercial advantage if we get this reputation stuff right. So we have to be thinking about it as a, at a board level all the time in all the areas of our strategy. We have to be looking at those trade-offs between moving something forward and what are we leaving behind? What is the, the offset against increasing our profit? Where are we cutting costs? What is the implication of that? Where are we taking shortcuts in order to do that, et cetera? And the, the, the systems, which you'll go into in a second, um, the, the um, King 4, the other uh, integrated reporting, et cetera, et cetera, talking much more about this trade-off, this trade-off between pulling one way and making sure you're not pulling too far because you need to balance things out. So it's far more about what you do and how you do it, not just the outcome. It's the whole process. So we can see that Boeing's change in process and shortcuts started to be seen as the output. And as soon as it was made a little bit more visible, as soon as someone could see through the curtain, they suddenly realized that the whole system was rotten and they had to almost start again from scratch. So it's, and we see it far, far more often in companies where they've we've picked up something in their supply chain process, which is not so kosher. Somewhere where they're polluting environment or using child labor or otherwise exploiting something along the way, so it's about how you do it, not just what you do. The end and the means are both important. So who do you have in your team? So we advocate that you move very strongly to the space of having great directors, not just good directors. Because if we have great directors with a really strong high performance board, we can change lives. And particularly in the African continent, we need to make sure we are driving strategy, we are demonstrating leadership, and we're implementing good governance. Because all of those things together can make sure that we deal and improve the lives of all of our stakeholders. If we can impact and improve the lives of our staff, if we can make a better deal for our suppliers, so they get, they've got an opportunity to get a little bit more profit in their margin, or we work more closely with them, we help make the logistics more profitable or effective, et cetera, et cetera. So they want to work with us, they want to partner with us, if we have the same kind of relationships with our clients, so there's much more of a partnership, there's much more of a win-win, two-way kind of um, engagement, all of those things start to impact the ecosystem we're working in. And then you can expand it to the community, you can expand it to your country, you can expand it to the environment, the world as a whole. And that fundamentally changes lives. So when looking to recruit directors, my, I suppose, suggestion, request, is that you look at the values and the attitude first. So are we bringing someone in who buys into the value system of this organization, buys into safety innovation, looking forward long term? If those are our values, make sure that, that person buys into it before you have any other conversations. Then make sure we've got an understanding of their personality profile, because particularly at board level, we need some kind of diversification. ID diversification over gender, but more broadly around the way we think and the different life experiences we've had, the different cultures we come from, etc. So profile is one way of picking up the things we can't change, which is the way we think. And then we can look at the particular skills and experience and see whether they are adding value, whether they're filling the gaps in this team so that we can cover as many bases as possible. And diversity is really about making sure that we can see the variability in as many different areas as possible so we can see the opportunities and we can see the threats as they come at us because we've got more eyes on the on the ball 
we've got more people looking in more directions naturally than if we've just got a board full of the same people who went to the same school, the same gender, the same age group, etc., which is way too common. And the profile tool we use is one called Contribution Compass, and it's very much about understanding which type of energy you have overall. So are you activating, are you naturally going to be looking towards an innovative space, looking to do, do things in a different way, change things up, which is why the profile is described as a catalyst, because it's about changing things. Or naturally, do we think about the people and people energy and seeing what's going on in the people space? Because they're different. And then sustaining energy is looking at the processes and procedures and the way we do things around here. That very sensible feet on the ground kind of energy, very different from the activating energy. And the refining is the one that we need probably most, but not necessarily initially. But if we're going to build a cash code, we're going to build a solid foundation of an, a business that's got legs that can that can be sustainable over a long period, we need to make sure we've got some refining energy in the room as well. Because they'll look at the data, they'll do the analysis, they'll check the facts. What are the facts telling us about what's actually happening? Not just we, what we think and hope is going to happen, but what is actually happening um, on the ground and is showing up in the numbers. So we need to make sure we've got a broad cross-section of profiles in the boardroom to cover as many of these bases and see things coming, as I said, as quickly as possible. So where are we in danger of suffering reputational damage because we're not looking after the people, either the people outside the organization or the people inside the organization? Where are we not innovating enough? Where are we looking to be seen to be rather staid and boring and completely off track? and out of, out of touch with reality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that fits together with what we call the CERDAR governance compass, where all of the pieces together, and I'll show you how that fits in with the new ISO 37000 standard as well. But the idea is understanding that we're pulling in different directions. So we've got purpose, we've got sustainability, we've got performance and conformance, all pulling in different directions. And these are the main areas of strategy we need to be considering. So when we're building our strategy direction, we need to be thinking about what is the reputational risk of going in that direction? Is that building on what we've done before? Is that changing what we've done before fundamentally and we go in deliberately and transparently? Or is it going to be taking us down the wrong path? Is it going to be damaging something that we've been done, that we've done before and that may not necessarily um, contribute to the long-term sustainability of the organization. And organizational culture the same, where we've got the right leadership. Are we engaging with stakeholders? Are we keeping the shareholders happy, et cetera, et cetera. So the model covers all of the main basis of governance. And if you attach reputation in all of those, um, it really makes a difference because during the course of the year, you'll cover all the major bases. And this other piece is the law of requisite variety is thinking about how in our teams, and obviously on our board, but as an organization as a whole, how are we exposed to different, different perspectives and viewpoints as we possibly can be? And where that becomes practical is to bring in independence. At least one independent director on the board came out in our survey as being absolutely critical because it gives you a different perspective. And even and then taking it one step further, there's definitely increase in EBITDA if you bring female representation, because boards are typically male dominated, bringing a greater ethnic diversity, and then overall conducting board evaluations, because it gives you that check in, make sure that you're actually doing things right. So how do you get all this done? Well, let's start with the law. If you are demonstrating care, skill and diligence, that's a major part of reputation, it builds trust. If you're if you are um, communicating effectively, it's part of this demonstrating skill, taking care in your approach because you're talking things through with people. You're getting opinions from outside the organization before you do anything fundamental. And then you're preparing, you're doing the, the slap work, the difficult work, the donkey work to try and get, make sure that we've covered off all the details. The other part is your fiduciary duty. So basically all of the, the um, guidelines that are out in pretty much all of the jurisdictions are now talking about this utmost good faith towards the company, which means you're 
acting in good faith, you're doing something to the benefit of the organization as the first point of call. You're not putting yourself first in that situation, whether you are a CEO, whether you are a board member, whatever context it is. We need to make sure we're doing everything in the best interest of the business. So again, that's driving that promise out, demonstrating leadership, making sure we're thinking strategically and being consistent acting and then doing, um, do not use the position for personal gain. So it's all about making sure we're not looking at ourselves, we're looking outward and what we can do to make sure that the organization is properly run. And then not exercising those powers, taking shortcuts, uh, making decisions without conferring with the rest of the board, et cetera, et cetera. So if we just get that bit right, it really, really helps. So Adrian Cadbury started the thinking around the social and economic goals and individual community goals pulling in different directions. And we need to be aware of it as a board, which is where our um, circular shape of our governance compass comes from largely, is thinking about the business as a balloon, thinking as it a ball, thinking as something that has flexibility and can be pulled in different directions. So in his concept, he's thinking about that pull between economic and social. So if we're focused on driving the economics, driving the profit, we tend to spend less time on making sure that we're looking after the, the, the people and all of the other things that go on in the social space, because we're just driving towards a particular stakeholder. And the other way is individual versus communal. So if we're focused on ourselves or we're focused on specific individuals with the organization, for example, some shareholders, we lose track of the broader context. We lose track of the broader um, stakeholder environment. And the bit that is the bubble, is the business, is this balloon, this circle. Because if we're pulling in any particular direction for too long, something's going to break. The company becomes distorted. And we could see that in Boeing. It became distorted because it was just pulling towards economic and to an extent individual for so long that something had to give. So when we go into the the systems that are now in place that you can use as your tools. One of the, the big ones is integrated thinking, integrated reporting, and it talks about the creation of value over the short to medium long term, thinking holistically about the resources and relationships and dependencies and trade offs. So when we go deciding to go in a particular direction, are we aware of the trade off? Is there one? Isn't there one? Usually there is. We've just got to identify it. And then we've got to make a decision to say, yes, we're happy with that trade off. The value is greater if we go in that direction than the trade off if we go in the other direction. So it, the, the integrated thinking guidelines are telling us to do that. This whole model around integrated thinking is trying to break it down into places where you can start to see it, visualize it, understand it better. So when we're thinking about what we're bringing into the organization, we have to also think about what we're taking out of the organization. So what is the impact if we put bring more money into the business or more have more impact on the human resources coming into the business? What is the impact of on human resources coming out of the business? What is the impact on the social and relationship coming out of the business? So we start to balance these two. We start to be much more aware that nothing is one sided. There's always an impact on the other side. And the ISO 37000, um, it's been fascinating to Roger and I, um, as we've been working through this, how similar the two are. So we've been running with the SIRDAR governance compass for nearly 15 years since its inception. And it covers all the same bases as ended up with the ISO 37000. But you can see very strongly in the middle is purpose. So where are we going? The promise concept. Then we've got value generation. We've got strategy, oversight, accountability. So value generation needs oversight. If otherwise we push too hard in one particular direction, we need to make sure we're viewing and understanding and monitoring things. Accountability and strategy. We need to both be covered. We need to make sure that our leadership is accountable for the strategy they're developing. They're taking responsibility if things go wrong and need to be adjusted. So going around all the different areas, we've been through that right earlier, and thinking about King 4 again recommends that organizational performance 
is moving much more into a long-term thinking. It's not about quarterly reporting anymore. It's much longer time frames, thinking far further ahead, not making short-term decisions, thinking about the 5, 10, 15, even 100-year impact of your company going forward. And then the integrated reporting specifically says report clearly on the outcomes and the trade-offs and explain the KPIs and link them to value so people can see transparently and that you're communicating much more effectively to the parties that are going to be impacted by your business. And also mentioned in the common factors that reduce the value of the report is how the organization cre creates, preserves or erodes value. So again, they're trying to encourage businesses to look further than just short term into medium and long term thinking about the impacts. So in summary, make sure you've got a clear understanding of what your promise is. If you don't understand what your value system is, then it's very difficult to make sure you have the right people, the right leaders, uh, there's nothing consistent to measure yourself against. And if anyone in the organization, anyone outside the organization doesn't have a clear understanding about what your promise is and what your value set is, they'll make their own mind up. They'll come up with their own answer. And that may not necessarily be healthy or useful. So we need to make sure that we're building reputation from understanding that it's a holistic thing. We need to be covering all of the different bases when we're thinking about reputation. We've got to make sure our strategy holds water. It ties in with our promise. That the, the organizational culture is understood and is clear and also drives the same kind of promise and same kind of um, drives the strategy. And we've got the right leadership, again, who bought into that value set and are driving the right actions. So making sure we've got the right board members appointed is absolutely critical. And then addressing reputation questions from strategic and the operational points of view. We've got to make sure that we're applying the things we've seen that are impacting the reputation, not just skirting over them, not glossing over them, making sure we dig really deep to see what's causing those changes. And supporting growth strategies appropriately and strengthening accountability. Because as we said right at the beginning of this, growing reputation grows your valuation. There's a direct correlation. So before we move to questions, just a quick high-level overview. What does Sirdar do? So Sirdar is the name for a lead Sherpa on a mountain expedition. So we want to help you on the journey, support you on the journey. Make sure you've got the right tools, got the right training, um, you're properly prepared for the, for the climb, and then go with you on that journey. So we do that by supporting your board through the guide process, appointing the right directors, non-exec directors, and doing the training, the education part to make sure you've got the skills you need. And if you want to consult or if you just want to chat to me afterwards, then please tick the box in the um, poll. And one thing that this Zanelli said was doing something like our Applied Directorship Program, Pride Directorship Program <laughs> took them from knowing very little about how governance properly worked and how they could add value as a board member and helped them identify what areas are lacking in their board and themselves and the company as a whole. So it's really important that we expose ourselves to as much training as possible so that we can start to see where the holes are, where the dysfunction is in our current setup, whether we need to make sure that we're doing a better job, whether the board as a whole needs to do a better job, but either way, it's going to have an impact on the business. And as Christos said, doing the Applied Directorship Program is a must. Anyone who holds it, a director title needs to put themselves through this type of learning curve to know what to expect and understand what your role as a director is. The most practical and certainly the most comprehensive director training that's out there at the moment. Um, that was the feedback we got from the Mauritius Institute of Directors that we started the program with last week. So yeah, give it a, if, you're, if you're interested in developing your skills as a director, then by all means, um, have a look. Um, certainly uh, happy to help you with other training options, um, whether it's related to chairmanship or um, how do you work better as a CEO with your, with your board, any of those kind of things, anything to do with what's going on in the boardroom, we can certainly look to help, how we can help you. 
And for those of you who are looking for non-exec director positions, we have a database, uh, the director network database of anybody who's looking for director positions. And whenever we get clients looking for new non-exec directors, we advertise through that platform. So by all means, um, let us know and we can send you the link uh, so that you can sign yourselves up. Um, and general board support services. If you are having problems with your board, you don't believe your board is performing at the level it should be, then please let us know and we'll be happy to have a conversation. If anyone wants to get contact with me, um, please drop me a line, send me an email, um, give me a call, however you feel most comfortable, and we can put something together, put something in the diary and have a, have a conversation. Um, question in the box. On Boeing, were the frequently changed CEOs from within the firm? So two of the CEO, one, the original CEO was from Boeing, and there was, uh, he was the one who ended up leaving because of uh, the scandal with um, uh, legal cases and, and people doing things they shouldn't have been doing. Um, he wasn't involved, but he felt like he should, it was on his watch, so he resigned. Then the next two were from the company they bought, then the third one, the one who got it right and made bucket loads of cash, came in as an external, um, an independent external CEO. And then they, uh, the new one, I'm not sure where he came from. I think he might have well have been an insider. So yes, they, they traditionally brought people in who rose through the ranks. Um, then they, in that wobble period, they brought them in from the other company that had a very different culture. And then they brought someone completely externally who had a very good reputation for turning businesses around and increasing their share price because that was their focus. And now things like looks like they've gone full circle and brought into someone who really understands what an engineering company needs to do in terms of quality, safety, et cetera, et cetera, because those values are very much more um, involved in the day to day than they, they have been for a long time. So I hope that answers your question, Yemi. Um, very good. There's all, all, all kinds of articles. There's timelines, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, on the internet. So it's well worth having a read um, if you're interested. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for spending it with me. And I look forward to um, engaging with those of you who are interested. Um, and otherwise, have an awesome afternoon and a great week further.